All right, I think we're all set. Um, again, we're passing around uh, note paper so you can write some, some notes and whatnot. Uh, in this session, we're going to do uh, both the new GT3 cars. You got the, the Audi and the Mercedes, um, the latest, the newest, the latest and greatest on iRacing, of course. As you guys who've been on iRacing know for a while, whenever something new comes out, everyone is all over it. And uh, this is the popular series, so you got a lot of people running this uh, GT3. Uh, plenty of races, lots of splits. It's good stuff, lots of fun. It's also really competitive. So, so I figured I'd get into these new cars. It, it'll, it'll help you guys get up to speed and um, kind of get into the different dynamic in each car and the different driving style as well. So the first car that we're going to get into is the Audi. And a um, little bit different setup dynamic with this car because uh, you know it's mid-engine, rear-wheel drive. Whereas the Merc is the opposite. So the Merc is going to be more like the BMW. <clears throat> the Audi is more uh, like the McLaren. Also in the way that it drives, too. So. And we'll start out. What's up? <laughs> well, I, I don't like the McLaren because I don't think it's realistic. And it's really skatey. But the Audi, you have good feel for the car. You, you know, you can, these newer cars are much better. So you've got much better feel for what's going on and you got more warning when the tire is about to break loose. And yeah, so even though th these cars are the newest cars, they are also, I think, the best cars on iRacing has ever come out with. Um, just a lot more intuitive to drive, a lot better feel for the road, for the tire. I think you get much better feedback through the wheel as to what's happening. So really fun, really fun series. Really good cars. All right, so baseline setup. We're going out. We're just going to, I'm going to kind of run you through how I would um, start dialing the setup in from baseline. I don't really have time to get into every single setup option, but I'll take questions at the end regarding that. So Rhode Atlanta is a good track. You get a lot of hills, uh, elevation changes, a lot of fast bumps, fast curb strikes. Um, perfect track to get into shocks for that reason. Low speed stuff here, medium speed stuff. And I'm not driving the Renault. I got to remember that. Don't have as much grip. Okay, so baseline setup. Um, it's kind of plowing, understeer, and corner entry. And on the first session, I talked about awareness. I mean, everything is about awareness, but it's specifically what you want to be um, building your awareness to. So once you learn the track and, and you know, kind of get a handle on the car and what it's doing, uh, not until then do you really want to start getting into setup or start thinking about setup. Uh, what I see a lot of people do is they have a tendency to overthink things and um, kind of <laughs> wondering why certain things are happening. Where it could be just simply like they don't know the track well enough or uh, they don't know the car well enough. So you, you really got to understand what the car is doing. And if the car is doing something that you don't want it to do, understand exactly where it's doing that specifically. So I'll just try to get loose here. Okay, so I crashed. I was going to say, I do that all the time. Yeah, right. <laughs> so I crashed, and you know, my, I want to blame the car, but it was probably me doing something wrong. So you know, it's important to distinguish the difference between what's happening with the car um, because of the setup versus your driving. So I can't see here. Okay, so we're in chase view. So I got it. I got loose when I went over this apex curb, so slow mo it. So it's a really good track for actually setting up your shocks too, because you can really see what the car is doing. So right when I landed over the curb, the car got loose. Um, 
So I would consider that a high speed rebound adjustment that you'd want to make. And also, mind you, I drove into the corner too fast, so that really unsettled the car more. But um, regarding, regarding the shocks, I'll kind of get into that first with this car. Regarding the shocks, um, you got to remember that the high speed settings, or you see high speed compression, high speed rebound in the front and the rear, the high speed settings are for not high speed corners. That's a really common misconception. That's not true. If you think like that, you're going to never get the shocks right. So high speed shock settings are strictly for um, fast curb strikes, hitting bumps, and really quick shock impact uh, moments. And that's when you're adjusting the high speed settings for. So high speed specifically for curbs. So if the car is doing something you don't like over the curbs, you adjust the high speed. And um, now, one of the hardest things to do with shocks, and it's usually the last thing I would recommend people to do, um, get the rest of the setup down first. But I wanted to get into to the shocks first here. Um, the hardest thing to do is when you're going from baseline and how do you get the shocks to, you know, how do you improve them or get them to where you want them to be? And I'll tell you that the, the shock adjustment should be the last thing that you do in the car, unless it's something that's really clear that the car is not behaving the way you want it over a curb then you can get into it. Now the low speed shock settings are even, I'd say probably more advanced. Um, but low speed shock settings, again, so don't let the low speed confuse you into thinking it's for low speed corners. It's not. Low speed is for weight transfer. Because weight transfer is um, when the shock is, uh, uh, you know, the shock's moving and, and managing the weight of the car and it's doing that slower. So the fast curb strikes are for the high speed. And that's strictly for stability over curbs and bumps. Low speed is strictly for weight transfer. How quick, quickly do you want the, the front to sit on the ground under braking? How quickly do you want the rear to rise under braking? And vice versa. Um, the easiest way to remember is just to kind of visualize what, uh, what each stock shock setting is doing to the car. So typically left is going to... Um, make the shock slower, but it's, it's going to make the shock extend more when you're going to the left. This is how I remember it in iRacing, because um, it gets really confusing. Just remember, when you go left in the shock, it's going to make that shock extend or compress more. So it's going to give you more uh, weight transfer. Now, going the other way will give you um, quicker weight transfer, but it's not going to make the car rise or, or uh, set in the ground under braking or acceleration as quickly. So an even more simplified way of thinking about it, if you want to take notes, um, front bump and rear rebound is going to control uh, weight transfer under braking. So front bump and rear rebound, and that's specifically in low speed. Um, and then front rebound and rear bump is controlling weight transfer on acceleration. Because what's happening in the car when you accelerate, that weight is being transferred to the front, from the front to the rear, and uh, vice versa for braking. So now it's a really fine adjustment um, and, and you really need to be pretty experienced to feel what it's doing, which is why I tell people to not get lost in sh tuning shocks um, unless you're like already pretty fast and close to the pace because there's other st stuff that will be easier for you to improve on. It's, you know, it's the hardest thing so I, and I see people all the time get confused with it. But in general, the thing you want to remember about low speed, again, weight transfer for low speed, um, front compression, rear rebound, deceleration, under braking, weight transfer. So say for instance, uh, I'm going to go to the left on my, on my compression. <clears throat> so what's going to happen under braking is that front, front of the car is going to dive a little bit further under braking. Um, and so usually I'll do the front and the rear equally. So the rear, I will also go to the left. So that'll allow the rear to rise and the front to lower. So now, if you think about what's happening to the car, um, it's kind of taking more of a dive, but the front and the rear end's rising easier under braking. So what, that's, what is that going to do? That's going to give you more uh, rotation on braking. The rear is going to be lighter. So now when you turn, that rear is going to be more susceptible to continuing to rotate as you turn, because it's lighter, higher center of gravity in the rear, wants to carry itself over. So if you're looking for um, more traction, you would go the other way around because you don't want that rear to rise. You want that rear to stay put. 
And the reason I say it's, it's really, um, it's pretty difficult to, to feel it is because you need to know the difference between when the car is starting to, uh, when the car is starting to get loose, you know, it might be brake bias, it might be um, anti-roll bar, it might be the rear uh, spring rate. Um, but then there's that weight transfer phase and the shocks are only affecting the way the car um, is, is balanced or unbalanced on weight transfer. So getting to that point where you know when it's actually weight transfer, when the car did something that you didn't want it to do, uh, it's, it's pretty difficult. So that's kind of low speed shocks in a nutshell. Now high speed shocks, high speed shocks are a little bit more accessible, I think, because it's easier to tell what they're doing pretty quickly because you, you, you're not second guessing yourself thinking, well, I changed my shocks, but man, the car's still like loose in this one area or something, under braking or uh, under steering and on throttle. There's a bunch of other stuff that I would go to before shocks. Now high speed, you can tell the difference very quickly because whenever you strike a curb, you can sense what the tire is doing. Um, so compression in the high speed is for um, that initial strike of the curb. So when, the car, so when the tire compresses as it goes over that curb, you know, how quickly does it do that? How resistant is it to that? So when it's, sh when it's softer, it's going to compress um, easier. So it's compressing easier. Um, and then under rebound, rebound is when the car is setting, that tire is setting back on the ground. So when the tire sets back on the ground, you want to get that tire on the ground as quickly as possible. Because you know, obviously when the car is airborne, you don't have any grip. So you want to get that tire right back on the ground, and that's going to give you the best possible traction off the corner. Um, so there's, there's no like, uh, right way to set the shocks for every track, and it depends on the car, because the, the parameters of the shock values are different for every car, so you can't just say, oh, run this, and then it'll apply to another car. It won't at all. I told you shocks are confusing, right? So. Um, what I do usually do as a kind of a rule of thumb, I like to have my high speed rebound be more to the right and my high speed compression more to the left. Because I want that tire to take that curb easier without unsettling the car. And then I want the tire to set back down on the ground quicker. Does that make sense? So um, just kind of the general idea of shocks, the best way to really learn it is to just go out there and try stuff. Go try maxing out settings to the right. Okay, you run a couple laps, go try maxing out settings to the left, and you will feel a difference. That's the best way to learn um, any kind of setup stuff. So, now with that said, um, the baseline setup, they, I don't really like the baseline in this car, and I'll explain why. Um, they made the rear compression really low to try to get more traction on power but the car is actually too soft, which is, what, what, which is, I think, what makes the rear end kind of unpredictable in weight transfer. Um, the Audi in particular, you need to make sure the, the, the rear isn't too soft, because when the rear of the Audi is too soft, it will start to um, kind of just continue to roll. Like, the rear end will continue to want to roll through the corner, and you'll have this kind of floaty oversteer feeling. It's kind of an uncomfortable feeling. So you want the car to be more uh, planted. And now when I'm driving, the reason I diagnose that as um, ARV is because it's, all, it's happening through the whole corner. Um, more so on weight transfer, but it's happening through the whole corner. So NA roll bar is, is your adjustment that you will make for uh, um, mid-corner balance, kind of mid-corner. It's like right after you've set into that turn that you carry in through the turn. So in a roll bar, I would stiffen it up a little bit in the Audi. This is kind of what I usually start with. Um, maybe s small and eight, we'll go with that. And I do like to have the front and the rear even. It's just a personal preference. I can't explain it in a like engineering way. Well, let me tell you this too. I'm telling you guys this stuff as a driver and it, you know, may or may not be theoretically right, but on iRacing, I know how it applies to the sim, so it does work better that way. Uh, front and the rear even, that just gives me the best balance, especially for rear engine cars. I like to have my spring rates even, I like to have my cambers even. And that's just kind of a, um, 
that's like my go-to setting, I guess, for, for rear engine cars, and I usually work from that. And I find that works pretty well in the Audi. So with that said, we'll, we'll lower the spring rate a little bit. Not too much, so we stiffen the inner roll bar. <coughs> Excuse me, so lower springs, the idea of lowering the spring rate, that's gonna give me um, a spring that's a little bit more compliant, easier to work with. Um, oops. And then stiffening the ARB is going to stiffen the car on lateral movement, which is specifically where I want it to be stiffer, not necessarily everywhere else on the track. Because like I was saying, with the Audi, one of the issues was that the rear was just really soft and it would want to roll over. And then it would feel good, and then all of a sudden you keep going through the corner and keep going through the corner, and the rear end would want to come around. And I could feel that that was on weight transfer uh, and mid-corner too. So an inner roll bar is only affecting the balance of the car when you're actually turning, any sort of lateral movement. Okay, let me just Before I continue, does anyone have any questions? You were talking a lot about uh, curb strikes and how this car handles curbs, and mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with the BMW and being able to drive over a smart car and still be able to drive it. Can you, can you set this car up so it's at least more compliant with curb striking? Because um, I noticed when I first got in it, I hit a curb and I lost it immediately, and I was like, well, I don't like this thing, so I'm just going <laughs> to drive it anymore. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's like that's the notorious thing, that it's not good on curbs. Um, pretty much like you, you can work with what you got with every car. Some cars are just not going to be good on the curbs. You know, in the Audi, I think, um, from what I remember, there was some issue where, like, the shock values were getting unstable or something, and they fixed, I can't remember, it was something like that, but they did uh, fix it in the last update. Have you tried the car recently? No. Oh, okay. Because they, they knew about that, and it was harder than it should be over curbs, no matter what you did with the shocks. You know, you can improve it, but it would still have that unpredictable feeling over the shocks. Um, it's better now, though, I can tell you that for sure, so. But yeah, aside from that issue, I think the car is really good. Um, and I don't notice it so much anymore. Any other questions before I go ahead? Um, in regards to the, uh, the rebound on your shocks, I understand that when you increase the compression of the, the bump side of the shock, you're increasing the resistance to which the shock compresses, but when you're adjusting the rebound, if you increase it or decrease it, are you basically, for example, if you, if you soften the rebound, is that the allowing the, the shock to just let gravity let it fall, or are you increasing the rate at which it actually pushes out? You um, see what I'm saying? Low speed or high speed? The, the low, well, the low speed in, in, in general. I mean, um, so if you, if, you, if you go one way on the shock, is that just basically saying that the shock is just allowing to free fall out, or is there actually a force pushing the shock at that you're adjusting on the rebound? Uh, well, there's going to be more force with more rebound, so to the right, there'll be more force pushing it down. Okay, so it's not just letting it fall, it's actually actively pushing it out. Yeah, if, if I understand you correctly, I, I think so, yeah. Okay, so... That's the hard stuff. Now we'll go to the more, uh, more straightforward kind of stuff to tune. Again, ARBs are really good to tune the car, um, and I will give an example of when I would use higher AR ARBs. So when, there's a track, when I'm at a track with a lot of faster corners, I like the car to be responsive <coughs> on that transition from braking to lateral grip. Uh, an ARB makes the car more responsive in that way. And a lot of the times what I like to do is run a little bit more ARB and then soften the spring rate. It just gives me a, a nice balance that, to me, feels good. It feels a little bit more planted and stable um, without, comprom without making the car too uh, soft you know, with the spring rate. Because when you lower the spring rate, you're softening the car. will have a little bit more mechanical grip. Stiffening the ARB um, will kind of sort of compensate that a little bit. Um, spring rates, I found, Pretty close to lowest is just my personal preference. Um, I mean, I can't tell you why other than it just feels good and it's fast, and that's ultimately what you're setting up a car for. Make it feel drivable, easy to drive. Of course, that's your end goal with, with any setup. You, know, you wanna make the car as easy to drive fast as possible. Um, and there's a lot of things that you can do like that with the, the compromises of 
springs and ARB and, and the balance and things like that. Let's see, so break bias, I kind of touched on this in the first session, but um, again, I prefer the ABS to be at 10. Um, I just, I like the feel of the car with high ABS. I feel like it's, it's the performance is just as good um, as it is with low ABS, except you don't have to worry about locking up. And uh, I just feel like I have better control, excuse me, on braking and turning. And uh, brake bias, again, as you increase the ABS, if you do want to try it, um, say you're running the ABS at six and you go up to 10, um, as you go up in the ABS, you will have to move the brake bias, uh, what is it? I think rearward is, is what you do, just to get the same feeling. I actually have it pretty far forward here. Brake bias is a preference. So <coughs> kind of breaking down when you make these adjustments and knowing how to make these adjustments, I know that's the hard thing about setups. Um, again, it just comes down to awareness to what the car is doing. For instance, say I'm going into a corner and I start braking. As soon as I start braking, okay, I'm braking, and then I start turning while I'm braking, and the thing snaps loose on me. So I know in my head, again, mental notes, always thinking about, you always want to think about why the car is doing what it does. Um, I know because of that initial turn in on braking, the car snapped loose, I know that's probably brake bias because that snap happened before that weight transfer even happened completely. Um, that's how I know it wouldn't be suspension shocks. So that's when you want to adjust your brake bias. That's the first thing. Uh, brake bias is the first thing that you want to start adjusting to, to, to get it to where you want it to be because it's the easiest thing to adjust and it's, it's pretty important. So you want the car to be settled from braking as soon as you start turning in. There's that period before that weight transfer completely happens. That's when the brake bias has taken effect. Um, Okay, ABS, brake bias. Now, getting into tow, um, you can kind of simplify it by just um, thinking you want to use as little tow as possible. It's going to save the tire. There's really no need to ever use much more than maybe two thirty seconds or a sixteenth of tow. Uh, that's tow in in the rear, tow out in the front. I never use tow out in the rear and tow in in the front, ever. So. Um, I like to keep the toe close to neutral. Uh, I will use toe out in the front, which is going to point those front wheels outward, which is going to help that initial turn in. Um, I will use that at a track with a lot of tight, low-speed corners, um, you know, to get that quick initial turn in that I that I need. A little extra bit of turn in. That's when I'll use a little bit of toe out. Maybe at a track like um, maybe Indy Road. Uh, I know that was on the schedule this season. You know, that had a bunch of low speed corners. And that helped get that quick turn in pivot before that weight transfer even happens. Um, so toe and brake bias are kind of similar in that they're both affecting the car um, on that initial turn in. Brake bias is going to be on the brakes. Toe is whenever you're moving the wheel. So, you know, being able to separate these things and tell which is which, it, it's hard. But, um, you know, continue to focus on that and then try to change everything individually and uh, focus on how it feels, and then you'll get better at setups if you do that. So toe and brake bias, very early in the corner. Um, now toe in the rear, I'll use a little bit of toe out in the rear if uh, I just want a little bit of extra comfort in the rear end on exit when I get on power. Now, toe is kind of a last resort. Um, toe in in the rear, it's kind of a last resort for me. Uh, because I like the car with neutral toe, it just feels better. It just feels more um, uh, like, like neutral and I can kind of control it better. I feel like when I have toe in in the rear, so you've got the rear tires pointed to each other, so you think about what's happening and that car wants to kind of center itself. So you're getting on the throttle and the car starts to get a little bit loose and then the toe kind of kicks it back a little bit. Um, when I have neutral toe, I feel like it's more organic, if that makes any sense. Um, easier to manage the rear end and it's like smoother. It's a driving lingo. Probably doesn't make sense to a lot of people. Okay. Brake pads, uh, medium friction. This is all preference. If you want a quicker bite uh, against the brake rotor, then use the high friction. I can modulate medium a little bit better, but tracks where you have a lot of heavy braking zones, that's when you might want to use high friction. So a track like Monza, maybe for turn one, um, that initial press of the brake, it'll 
it'll grab and, and slow the car down a little bit sooner. It's easier to brake for threshold braking, straight line braking corners. The ride height for the Audi, I, I like to um, keep, it, keep it low in the front. That just seems to be the best thing with these cars because you're not bottoming out, so you might as well get the front as low as you can. You're always going to get more downforce running the car low as long as you're not um, bottoming out on a curb or the car isn't doing anything crazy on a curb, then run it as low as you can. And the rear, uh, this rear wide height gives me a good balance, so I just leave it at 5.1. Uh, 5.1, 5.2 is pretty good. And again, that's just a rake that I found suitable for the car to where if I start to raise the rear higher, then it starts to become unstable. Um, on turn-in, weight transfer, the rear is too high. I can, I can sense that, so I work with this, and then I set up my car around this ride height. You know, with, with the setup stuff, I mean, a lot of stuff does similar, it makes, has similar effects on the car. Um, getting a good setup is all about how you kind of compromise everything and get it working together. So that's why when you get a good baseline setup that you're happy with, you, you really won't have to change it much at all. Camber settings, on this car I like to have the front and the rear even. Um, just gives me a little bit better confidence in the car. Uh, Mid-engine type of cars usually I'll run more rear camber. Um, not more than in the front, but pretty much the same camber front and rear on mid-engine cars. Okay, now tire pressures I can get into with the Merc because the tire pressures are, are the same. So I'm gonna switch cars here. Yeah, because I loaded the default setup. So, yeah, like from default setup, I would, pr I would put the cameras maybe at about 1.8 all around or 2 all around. Probably start with that. <laughs> Say what? <clears throat> all these steps you give us, could you give us the order that you would do them in? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question, and thanks for bringing that up, because I'm trying to run through it in two cars quick. But... Um, that's really important. When you're, when you're setting up a car, you want to have like a systematic kind of plan of how you're going to make what adjustment. The first thing I do, I, I go into um, the brake bias. I'll get the brake bias the way I want it to be. And um, also the tire pressures, because that's a really easy, quick adjustment that will... Uh, that will, um, when you get the tire pressure set right, the car is going to feel a lot better too. So that's something I do before I even start tweaking other stuff because tire pressure is, um, there's an optimal setting and you get it there and the car is going to feel way better. Otherwise, it's going to be skating, you're going to be wondering what it is, you know. But um, with the GT3s, I've already found, so 188, 180 kPa or, does anyone know what that is in PSI? 26? Yeah, okay, it's like 26, 26.5 hot is about where you want to be. So with the tire pressures, when you're um, trying to find that hot pressure, you want to run at least, at least maybe five lap run. And that'll, uh, that'll give the tires a chance to really come up to the temp that they're actually going to come up to throughout the whole race. After about five laps, they're up to where they're going to be. So about 26, 26.5 PSI. Now to get to those pressures, um, generally, your starting pressure is going to be, I think, about 23, 23.5. So that's for GT3. And um, again, the way that you figure this stuff out is you just got to go and run laps and run consistent laps. And with the tire pressures, there's a big difference between running it too low and too high. So get that out of the way first. And so, say I'm getting into a new car, Mike, like you had asked. Um, the next thing I would do, uh, I would go into the um, the spring rates, the ARBs, and the ride heights, kind of all together. Um, you can kind of quickly see what the car's about with the spring rates. It's going to take some testing, especially if it's a new car. But um, usually, it, you, you play with the spring rates. You adjust the front and rear to where. The car gives you a balance that's at least sort of predictable um, from entry to mid to exit. That means the car is pretty well balanced. So with the, the Audi, I found equal spring rates all around gives me a good comfortable balance. Um, 
that isn't too twitchy or snappy on turn in or corner exit. So spring rates and then ARBs. Um, the, the, let me think, the front wheel drive, or not front wheel drive, front engine cars. Front engine cars, usually you're gonna run more spring rate in the front and then you're gonna run less in the rear. So you get your spring rates and your interval bars. And your ride height is going to be specifically, you're going to notice the ride height more on turn in, um, more in how the car, how abruptly or how quickly the car turns in. That's going to be your ride height. And um, let me think here. So your spring rate, your rear spring rate when you increase or decrease the spring rate, that's going to affect the car more, the balance of the car more from mid corner to exit. That's a good way to be able to tell or adjust your spring rate to where you want it to. And um, all of this has uh, all of this has to be in relation to what wing you're running. Because if you're running higher wing, you're going to need to compensate for that extra rear downforce and make it work better by stiffening the rear spring rate and um, and raising the rear ride height usually. So as I go up in the rear wing, I will go up in ride height. I always do them simultaneously. Same with the rear spring. Usually, I'll do more rear spring. It depends on the track and the type of corners. So for instance, at a track like Brands Hatch, where you've got a lot of high-speed corners, you've got to take advantage of the downforce to get through those high-speed corners fast. So you're going to be relying more on downforce rather than um, uh, mechanical grip. So when you increase the downforce, now the car is going to have a ton of understeer. And so you're going to have to raise the ride height up and stiffen the rear spring rate up as well. That, that's for all cars. All the GT3s, yeah. Oh, he, he asked if, uh, well, I'll let him repeat it. He, um, he just asked if that applies to all cars, and the answer is yes. That uh, it definitely applies from what I've seen, most all GT cars. So you raise the rear downforce, you're going to have to compensate for the extra rear grip, and then you make, you, you make more of it when you raise the rear ride height. So would you then also raise the front spring to be equal, since you said you liked them equal? Yeah. In the, um, in the Audi, I would, but in the Mercedes, I would probably have the rear a little bit closer to the front. So like the spring split, so like the front springs will be, say, say right now they're 1571, and then right now it's 1429. Okay. And this has a weird set here. Why? Excuse me. Hang, uh, hang on. One second. I want to answer your question. Sorry. Um, so, you, so you got 571 and 1286 here. So if I were to increase the downforce, for instance, I would go with this set that's 1429 in the rear and, oh, not that one. The one that's 14 and 15 in the front. Does that make sense? So that's going to give me a little bit better rotation off the corner, a little bit better bite. But now I got more downforce pressing that rear, rear end down, so I got to make up for that. Okay, sorry. So after you go through all that, do you go back to your tire pressures and do you think that there's, uh, do you use asymmetrical tire pressure on your cars? Um, that's a good question. Because you actually, you can and it works pretty well. So like for a race setup, we'll usually run asymmetric uh, tire pressures. For qualifying, I usually run the tire pressures the same because you're only doing two laps. You know, you think about it, the tire doesn't have enough time to really get up to the pressure it's going to be at for the rest of the race. So equal tire pressures in qual. Um, yes, asymmetric tire pressures in the race. And you're going to figure that out by at least doing five lap runs. And then, you know, your whole goal is you're just trying to get the all four tires to be as close to 180 as you can. Sorry. I have too many Europeans on my team. They all want to do the other units. Um, 26.5, I think, 26.5 PSI hot, yeah. Okay. Oh, Wyatt, can I ask a question about the tire pressures? Oh, yeah. Uh, I was looking at the Pirelli P0. I mean, I don't know how accurately our racing models it, but Pirelli recommends uh, low 28s for the GT cars, mm -hmm. and I've been running that in uh, some of my leagues, and it seems pretty successful. It also seems to take with telemetry about maybe 10 or 13 laps to get up to full operating temperature oh, a yeah? lot of times okay. now. Um, so 28 hot, yeah, that's like probably 190 something, KPA. Um, you know, some people like running 
the pressure is that that much higher. And that's a, that you bring up a really good point that I forgot about. But also, the the optimal tire pressures is kind of a preference. Um, basically, the higher tire pressure you run, you're gonna get a car like the car is gonna feel more um, kind of responsive, uh, especially in high speed. Now, the lower you go in the pressures, it's going to feel a little bit more almost sluggish. The tire's going to feel a little bit more sluggish, but you will have better traction in low speed. So some people prefer like 25.5 hot, and then so that other people prefer, like you said, 28, because that probably gives you a kind of more reassuring feeling in faster corners, and the car just feels a little bit more responsive and alive a little bit. But now I run lower because it's just faster for me, I, and I've actually it baffles me because some of my teammates like higher, but I'm faster with lower. So it, some of it must have to do with driving style too. But yeah, so there's no wrong answer. So, you know, whatever works for you. Okay, so the Merc is a big, heavier uh, front engine rear wheel drive car. It's, it's like a bigger BMW. So this car, um, the driving technique is gonna be quite a bit different. Well, not that much different, but there's just nuances in how you want to drive this car and set up, set it up around that driving style. Now, this car is not going to um, rotate as well like on throttle like the Audi. It's the Audi's rear engine, so you have tons of traction off the corner. That's just how rear engine cars are. So this car's front engine, so you know the rear end gets extra light under braking, and um, that's its advantage. Well, braking and turn in, getting the car to the apex under braking. That's where it's a bit better. The Audi, you're going to have to kind of wait for it to rotate until you get to the apex. Once you get to the apex, it has better traction off the corner from apex off than any of the other GT cars. Um, yeah, even more so than the McLaren, I think. So that's one thing to consider. You can never, you're never going to get the, the Merc to drive like the Audi or vice versa. You know, just a front engine car is going to be a front engine car. You, gotta, you, know, you want to understand it's where its strengths are going to be at. And you can also make the car set up uh, better based around that. So just for instance right there, I went through turn one and um, felt pretty understeery. Now the understeer through turn one is going to be aero understeer. So it's kind of washing out there a little bit. So in that, in that corner, uh, when you get understeer in one, you, you know it's pretty much aero um, because that's a very high load, fast corner, and that's where you're going to notice the, um, that's where you're going to notice the aero balance the most. So you know, just distinguishing between aero and mechanical grip is also really important. Um, aero grip, aerodynamic grip, feels more um, abrupt, I guess, whereas mechanical grip changes is more like you can feel weight transfer and then it kind of breaks loose. It's a little bit slower. But uh, aero grip also only really fast corners. So fast corners, when you're aero loose, the car gets loose and then it gets really loose all of a sudden. It's really hard to save it. Mechanical loose is a little bit more forgiving. It's easier to, to deal with. So we could probably go down on the wing a little bit. Now that would help for turn one, but then you've got to compromise for the rest of the track too. And the differential preload is a really important adjustment for um, all the GT cars, because I think it's, it depends on how you, like, uh, how you like to drive the car. If you want to get the car to turn better on the brakes, um, almost like more of a front wheel drive, sort of, if you want to get the car to rotate better from the beginning of turn in to the apex, then you will want to lower the preload. That way the car will, tr it'll be easier to trail brake. Um, and this is separate from weight transfer. So this, this happening is kind of just happening regardless of how much weight transfer. It's always going to be the same because that's differential, so it's, it's separate. And again, that's another thing that you would have to feel and practice and just try it by itself and, and then you can feel it, you know when you're trying this stuff on your own and, and trying to get to feel these changes, um, make sure you do one at a time when you're learning it. It's the best way to learn. It's trial and error. 
So with that said, I like the diff preload and this car, I think around 20. And that's just uh, my, my personal preference. Uh, with these front engine cars, typically I like to have stiffer front ARV than rear. Um, like the BMW, usually I run a little bit stiffer in the front than the rear in BMW. So for instance here, the baseline in this car is pretty good actually. Um, and you've got all these weird numeric values, but it's all the same stuff, you know, regardless of car to car. So it's always like more is stiffer and less is softer. More is um, a car that is going to bite more in fast high speed corners, give you more traction. And then less is going to give you a car that's going to roll over and be sluggish on those lateral transitions left to right. That's your anti roll bar. So, yeah, stiffer front than rear generally uh, how I like to set up the cars. Don't want to get the rear too soft. This car doesn't have the same problem as the Audi where um, if you have too soft of a rear, it will just start rolling over and like continuing to want to slide and slide and slide. So this one isn't as bad. Now the camber settings with this kind of car, um, with the front engine car, I like to have a little bit more uh, camber in the front than the rear. Um, probably Maybe like a half a degree of camber difference, front to rear is pretty good, or thereabouts. And uh, the default, again, is a pretty good place to start. Now, one, one thing before I get into Q&A, but I know a lot of people use MoTeC for setups, and I'll tell you that it's, it's, uh, it's useful for some stuff, but for a lot of stuff, it's, you're going to end up like going in circles and not going faster. For instance, with cambers, um, certain values of cambers are faster, even though the data in MoTeC wouldn't lead you to believe that. So like in theory, it doesn't make sense, but it's just faster. So it's, that's why it's important to just test stuff rather than just use data, you know? So definitely just make sure you get out and test. And when you're testing, eliminate all variables, you know, that, that way you can really start to build your awareness to what the car is doing. Anyone got questions? Do you decide what cambers to run based on tire temps, or how do you decide what camber to run? Yeah, thanks for asking that question. Um, uh, not so much tire temp. Tire temp and irising, well, it's, um, it's been pretty confusing for a long time. It's getting better now, but uh, I usually, here, let me go to the tire menu here. Usually uh, the, the middle and the inside, I like to have pretty close to being the same is a pretty good range. Um, too much is when uh, uh, you just, it's all inside and then there's like no middle. If you've, if you've got the middle and the inside of the tire relatively even or close to even, then that's like a workable range. And then from there, you just go by feel and try stuff. Usually what I'll do is I'll go and do a couple lap runs with like say the camera the way it is, 2.4 in the front, okay, and then I'll go try four laps at 2.0, and then I'll go try four laps at 1.5. And I'll keep the rear to, the front to rear proportion the same, and just incrementally go down or up by three or four. That's how I'll figure out quickly, you know, what, where am I getting closer to the optimal setting? Because at the end of the day, I mean, it's just lap time, you know, what gives me the best grip. And, you know, just the only way to figure that out is just test, so. You load into the session, and it's a 130-degree track temp. <laughs> Don't what do you, you love do that? with your tire pressures right away? Because it's been a controversy. Like yeah, a yeah, hot, yeah. A, a hot track, you up your tire pressures, mm -hmm. or is it the other way around? Clarification. Yeah, yes, gosh, that's like, uh, we, you know, it's funny. We dealt with that in the Blank Pain series a lot, and we, like, actually ended up overcompensating and going slower because we thought we had it all figured out like oh like every five degrees we're gonna go up a half psi we're gonna beat everyone but no we ended up getting like completely killed because <laughs> we were like way too high in tire pressure and we were sliding around the whole race um i'll tell you that even when it's the the temperatures are way higher than they are in default weather um or way lower like any extreme you never really want to go too far from where you're at is what i found because we try to chase that and try to go Okay, we'll try to go higher and, and see, you know, if that keeps the tire cooler or something. It just doesn't seem to work. I'll say a good, uh, a good reference is if it's, like, way higher past default, um, I would go maybe up, like, a click or two. So, yeah, you are going to go up if it's higher, but don't go more than, like, a click or two. You, know, you don't, you don't want to do anything too drastic because, really, the weather does not affect 
um, that optimal pressure, which is really all you're concerned with. You know, it doesn't affect that optimal pressure too much. So if it's really cold, um, maybe go down a little bit in pressure. And I'll tell you this, just to confuse you guys even more, and I don't know why it's the way it is, but in the Renault, um, I go up in the tire pressure when it's colder because the car is just really, really hard to drive on the first lap on cold tires, on a cold track. And um, it just seems to work better through, throughout the race. So. That's why you just got to test this stuff. You know, there's no, uh, yeah, there's no right or wrong. So any other questions? Not so much for setup in general, but you've been a BMW driver for a long time. Which one of the two new cars do you like better? Um, man, I, I don't know. I haven't spent as much time in the Merc, but I like the BMW. Probably the Audi, just because I've driven it a little bit more. They're both really nice. I'm definitely enjoying them both. <laughs> yeah, um, you mentioned <laughs> when you were chasing, talking about camber, uh, and looking at your inside and middle temp, you said you changed the rear also. So yeah. So if you're having an issue with the front not quite being at the right temperature, you you change the rear on that same side, or do you? Well, is it all four what I'll do first when I adjust cambers is um, I want to get all four tires to where they're e they're wearing or not wearing, but the temperatures are even, like inside to middle, and then that like split front to rear whatever I find. Usually it's like 0.5 higher in the front than the rear, and I'll just stick with that. And, um, but so I've already kind of figured out the middle and inside before that, if, if that makes sense. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's it. If you guys don't have any more questions, I know it was real quick, but if, if you all want to ask me stuff, like you got my email on those notepads, so. Why is it that when you get a setup from somebody, and like some setups, like it feels like it's steering from the rear, and the other <laughs> cars, it seems like it's steering from the front. Yeah. Like what is so drastically different with these setups? <laughs> because some people like to drive the car absurdly loose, and I don't know why. I don't. I like the car to be easy to drive. I try to make the car stable. So you can be fast and have a stable setup. Don't think that you need to have some crazy alien setup. Especially now that iRacing has gotten better, where you can set up the car more realistically, too, and it works. So. Hey, Wyatt, hey. is there a way to save time maybe by having the same setup for several different tracks? Oh, that, yeah. Yeah. Work? Yeah, good question. Um, the hard work is all in when you're just learning the car. Once you've figured out the car, you can pretty much stick to very similar settings and only adjust stuff like um, um, pretty much like rear ride height, um, rear downforce and rear spring rate is like all you will really need to adjust from track to track once you get a good baseline set up. So you do not have to do all this stuff over again and figure out every single thing from track to track. What about the wing? What about the wing? Yeah, with rear downforce, it'll change with track to track. So when you change that wing, then that will change your ride height probably to get that balance where you want it with more downforce. Rear ride, ride height. And rear spring rate. Oh, no, she, she I'll, I'll tell you, she asked, um, she just wanted to make sure, rear spring rate, rear uh, ride height, and rear wing is what I will usually adjust um, from track to track. And then the rest is like really small stuff, maybe like um, neutral toe or maybe like a click of toe in in the, the front or something, or I'm sorry, in the rear, not the front. And uh, again, the toe out maybe. If the track has a bunch of tight corners. Like if I was race, if I was doing a race at Long Beach, which I love that track on iRacing, but you never get to run it. Um, if I was running there, like that track has a lot of tight corners, so you want, you need to get that quick turn in. You know, before that weight transfer even happens, you don't have time to wait on weight transfer. Those corners are so tight, so you you know you get that little bit extra toe in. That'll help you get through like those really tight hairpins, like the last corners and and stuff like that. That's what that's what toe is good for. As a completely naive question, I would, it, it, it seems to me obvious that, that less wing means faster on the straightaways. We haven't been talking about balancing how fast the car is versus how it feels. Mm -hmm. So it would seem like there'd be a trade-off between having <coughs> less downforce and putting up with a looser car in the turns versus going faster in the straightaway in terms of getting time. Yeah. 
how do you trade off how it feels versus yeah. how fast it is? Um, yeah, it depends on the track. Like uh, Monza, we used a ridiculously low wing just to be able to keep up when we were running the BMW. Um, we were using minus two wing at Monza in the BMW, and you know that's like makes the rear end feel like it's on ice. <laughs> but we just had to drive it like that and get used to it. Now, with that said, and that's a great question, when you have it the wing that low, you've got to stabilize the car in a lot of other ways to make it even drivable. So we would soften the rear end and roll bar with the wing at that low, um, lower the rear ride height, lower the spring rate in the rear, you know, just trying to soften the rear so that we have some mechanical traction to work with at least, so we're not completely, you know, drifting everywhere. Um, and it's just going to be harder to drive with low wing, but you can do some stuff to alleviate that. So, I, th I think that's pretty much. Yeah, that's a, that's about it. So, yeah. you're, so you're making that judgment simply when you look at your time and go, we need another second. On. Yeah, right. Yeah. Because any time you change the wing, you're going to have to, like, you're trying to get the balance back to where it is, to where the car is relatively consistent on braking and turn-in to apex, and then <clears throat> apex to exit, back to power. So braking, power. So you're trying to get that balance consistent on initial turn-in, weight transfer, mid-corner, you know, peak lateral grip, uh, weight transfer, apex to exit, and then off the corner, traction. And that's all that setup stuff that you're tweaking here and how it's working together throughout the whole corner. Um, and the way that I that we do it, like simplified, is again with uh, you know less wing, we're going to go lower in the rear, we're going to soften the rear, basically. Higher wing, stiff in the rear, raise the car. Um, and yeah, j based on lap time, pretty much. Going back to a track like Long Beach, a really tight, uh, where there's a lot of tight corners. Would you ever run toe out in the rear, just maybe a click or so, just to help the car rotate around some of the sharp corners? Um, no, I, you really wouldn't. <laughs> no, I mean I I wouldn't because because uh, then you it's gonna like mess up your uh, traction on corner exit. You know, yeah. like maybe in the entry it'll feel good under braking, but then you when you accelerate, you're not gonna be able to have good traction coming off. Okay. Um, but I'm sure someone has tried it at some point. The, the car wants to keep rotating. Yeah. Maybe like I'm sure like I'm sure like drifters set up their car like that. <laughs> so uh, we were talking about wings. How, what? How do you adjust the the gurney flap and the wicker bill? You know what's the difference between a gurney flap and a wicker bill? And hey, all that's that no stuff? fair. That's not a GT3 setup question. <laughs> the gurney flap's not on a GT3. Oh, see, see I don't even consider that a GT3 car. Wow. Ah, <laughs> no, that's I like see. that's like the one car that I have not driven in the longest time. But um, <laughs> who me? Oh. oh yeah, but then like the BMW came out since then, and like the Audi came out, the Merc came out, like all this cool stuff came out since then. No, but it's it's a good car. But um, okay, so how do you how do you decide like how when to use the gurney, not use the gurney, and then go up and down to the arrow? Is that how how exactly? You know, how do you feel that? Enhances or yeah, whatnot. no, that's a good question. Because it um, affect your setup. Yeah, and the Porsche. Um, what, from what I remember, that that gurney flap, when you have it checked, I mean, you get a crap ton of downforce, right, on the rear. So, it's really good for um, uh, tracks with a lot of corners. If you got a track with any kind of straightaway, then you just got to test and see if the trade-off is worth not having it, and then you, know, you take off that gurney flap. Um, you're going to have a lot less traction, but if it's a track, like maybe VIR would probably be a track where you might not use the gurney because um, you got those two straightaways. You can make up that time that you would probably be losing a little bit, struggling through the S's and all that. So it's just a trade-off in finding that balance. But um, I think from what I remember in that car, like you would run the gurney, you could run the gurney flap and then run the wing really high, or you could run without the gurney flap and run the wing in the middle or, or no, sorry, other way around, I think, yeah. Um, but it's been so long since I drove that car. But it's just testing, figuring out what the compromise is. All right, thank you, everyone. Let's give one a hand. Thanks.